Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We've got the toughest interview in the world today because we're interviewing Deborah. Uh, Deborah's got a book coming out uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, it's either going to be late December or early January, and it's called Uncovering hum Hidden Human Capital, How Leading Corporations Leverage Multiple Abilities in Their Workforce. So nice and short title there, um, uh, <laughs> but I'm sure it's going to be excellent. Um, so really pleased that you're getting to see the light of day with this book, Deborah. I know you've been working on it for an awful long time, and, and the only reason we don't have a set date at the moment is because of the typesetters. So um, it's it's imminent. Um, so tell us a bit more about the book. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me on Access Chat. Um, it, you're right, um, it, Neil. It has taken... Um, um, almost two years to create this book and the book is about um, employing people with disabilities but it's from the employer's perspective and I wanted to make sure that I didn't want to just speak from when I first started it I didn't want to speak just from the US perspective um, even though I, I live in Virginia I really wanted it to be a global exploration of you know what was happening all over the world and what could we learn from each other um, and so I, I wrote you know I started writing the book and then I um, I was talking to Excel Lebois the CEO of um, G3 ICT and I told him what I was doing and he said you know we would really love to be the publisher and so um, you know that's how that came about and um, and I've, I've rewritten the book probably about five six seven eight times um, but but that's okay too because the topic has changed a lot in several years and um, and, and I think it's very important that you know we have the right information in there it's targeted toward towards CEOs um, because we really want them to understand that they could actually be successful in employing people with disabilities and we want to make sure that we brag about the uh, corporations the organizations all over the world that are actually successfully doing it okay and 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 just for our viewers that, that have joined it in the last few months, so G3 ICT is the accessible uh, accessible technology um, arm of the United Nations, and Axel Lebois is the, the CEO, and you can go back through our archive and see our interview with Axel too. So um, it's exciting, really. I, I think it's great that, that you're doing it from, from a different viewpoint. Um, what, a, what about, uh, so I know you're addressing it with the, the CEO level, uh, have you been also addressing it with the, sort of the head of HR level or is that something that, that you feel has already been addressed and so it's, it's, it's coming at it from a completely different angle? Well, and, and that's a really good point because I say I'm taking it, I'm looking at it at the CEO level, but to be honest, it's not just the CEO level. I mean, what, it, what I wanted to do when I was writing it, and I remember Excel, who is a mentor of mine, he was saying, you know, think about the business books you like to read, Deborah, and, um, you know, think about a CEO in the United States or the United Kingdom or in India, you know, reading about this, you know, what get to the point almost. I, I write like I talk. I have a tendency to over talk. And so um, so it is created for the HR manager. It is created for the strategist in the company. It's created for the C level. But it 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 explores every single aspect of the HR, you know, journey, you know, from not only employing people with disabilities and accommodating people with disabilities but retaining people with disabilities as well and it 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 talks about it goes through an organ a typical uh, corporation in that what does the marketing department need to be thinking about when they're talking when, when they're thinking about this topic you know what does operations need to think about what about you know the product development people what about the IT department and my website and my intranet and my training. I mean, the, this is such a, as we know on Access Chat, it's such a multi-dimensional topic. So not only are we talking about, you know, candidates with disabilities, but we're talking about employees 
with disabilities, um, hidden and visible disabilities. We're talking about accommodations. We're, and then, of course, you have to talk about, since many of the corporations that I feature in the book are multinational corporations, not all of them. Some of them, for example, I feature um, Woolworth from Australia and um, SAP in Germany, but SAP, of course, is, you know, all over the world. And so um, I interview leaders like uh, Susan Scott Parker, also um, a um, former Access Chat guest. And, you know, what's happening? What are they doing um, with that part of the organization that, Neil, I know you're very active in? Um, and so it's really designed, it's not designed, I will say it's not designed to tell you every single thing you ever need to know, but it is, um, it's sort of designed to set the, 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 um, the playing field, a level playing field. So as an employer, um, you know, what do I need to do and, um, what steps do I need to take and how do I reduce my risk? So things like that. No, you, you are. We have been talking ab uh, about the importance of uh, of the book and uh, f for in, in terms of the private sector. How about the public sector and government? Do you think that people that are uh, leaders from from government can also take advantage from the from what we have explored on this book? Well, and that's a great point, Antonio. Because yes, I do think so. I I do speak mostly um, the examples that I provide are from corporations, global corporations all over the world. But it is for employers. So whether you're you have you know uh, ten thousand employees at your government agency, or you have you're part of a you know a five person nonprofit or a small business or corporation, it, the what I talk about in the book and the journey that many of these corporations have taken can be applied across the board. It, it, it and it talks about the risks aspect as well as the carrot aspect, you know, your brand aspect, the marketing. I really tried to capture the landscape of it and then actually talk about who is successfully doing it and supporting it, uh, the supporting these efforts as well. I also talk about, um, I, I mentioned this um, in one of our interviews, our past interviews a couple of weeks ago, but, um, and I know Neil, you were surprised when I said this, but one of the findings in the book was um, what was happening in France. And we found that in France, many times um, over the last years, um, for the instead of employing people with disabilities, we saw many of the corporations just paying the fines. And yet then um, the government stepped in and said, well, maybe what we need to do with these corporations is provide them with more supports. And so they had service providers step in and start helping these corporations. And we saw the amount of people with disabilities getting employed in France really go up, the amount of penalties that were being paid go down. And so there's some interesting statistical information in the book that is being captured from all over the world and also um, from the UN and from the International Labor Organization, from the, the disability, uh, the Business Disability Forum, for example. Um, so just trying to capture the data that we know is there and put it in one place. Uh, let me tell you a story that happened recently on, on the recent elections for the Portuguese Parliament. So uh, we have laws that in relation to, to accessibility for more than 20 years. And in, in the parliament, they came across recently in the last elections that they have w one of their members has a disability and is using a wheelchair. So the place where they have approved all the regulations and where they spend a huge amount of money renewing the building just about four or five years ago is a place that is not accessible at all. So, and uh, there were some, some interesting um, uh, videos and interviews in national television where they were showing you the Portuguese par parliament and the struggle of that, of the person in a wheelchair to move within the parliament. So, countries have, uh, have regulation in place for so many years, but sometimes it just doesn't work. No, I, I I agree, and I think we all we all know that that, that the regulations can be there 
and never enforced. So I think you've got you've got a, a, a chapter or, or a part of the book explore, uh, exploring the global carrot and stick, and I think it's it's really interesting to see the the different approaches in the in the different parts of the globe as to who applies more carrot and who applies more stick. Um, so maybe you could tell us a bit more about that because you know we're we're, we're sat here from our national perspective. Well, the, you know, it, it, one thing that happens, as you know, I travel all over the world speaking about these topics, and it's, I believe, um, at least in the beginning, when I started being invited about five, six years ago to speak, sometimes I was invited because I was from the U.S., and the countries that were inviting me, um, a lot of the countries were de are developing countries. They just were assumed the United States had nailed it because we just celebrated our 25th um, anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I pretty much have to say, well, <laughs> we haven't really nailed it yet. We've we've had amazing progress, but there's a lot of work to do, and the United States actually is learning a lot from looking at what other countries are doing more successfully. One thing that we are doing in the United States is we have that stick out, and we're just beating, we're beating the corporations with it. We got it out, and we're just whipping them. And, um, and we actually have sort of had a, a reverse um, thing happen there in that we are starting, we're having so many lawsuits, um, all of them settle, all of them settle, um, and that there are uh, law firms that, and we talked about this a little bit when we interviewed Lainey um, a few weeks ago on Access Chat, but there are actually uh, law firms that are making a lot of money by just suing our corporations and saying, your websites aren't accessible, and so we're going to sue you, and then the corporations don't make the websites more accessible. They just pay the lawyers money to go away. They just settle. Um, and then they get sued again and again and again. And so it's, it, it has become a real problem in the That's United counterproductive. States. That's counterproductive. Yes, it's very counterproductive. And, and the, you know who loses, Neil, are the people with disabilities because That's we good. still don't have access to the websites. Yeah. It, so, it's, so, it's, so then you want someone that doesn't want to – so then you need someone that doesn't want to settle or you need someone – like Laney, that's going to do some structured negotiation. Right, right. So, and, and, and so with all this story, those, there's a group that is actually not benefiting from this. So people with, who actually need access, yes. they don't get any benefits from those right, stories. Right, right. But a lot of lawyers are making a whole bunch of money and some, you know, some accessibility experts are making good money as they, um, you know, advise the lawyers. And, and, and we're all about capitalism in the U.S. And, and I appreciate that, but I... Um, it, it's it's a very disturbing trend, and um, our lawsuits are way up in the U.S. And so, um, there oh, once again, there's a lot of really, really, really good stuff that happens in the U.S. as well. But if you're a corporation in the U.S. trying to include people with disabilities, um, there's a lot of fear. And I remember being on a, a phone call once with a lot of other leaders and corporations, and there was a group leading it who I will not name and they were saying we just wish employers would stop being so afraid in the United States about employing people with disabilities we, we and why are they all so afraid of us what and I was like um because we're suing them and because we take their brands and we drag them through the mud and we that's why they're afraid of us we you know often it's not seen as a partnership of course it's not a I'm generalizing but there is, it, we got that stick out so well in the United States that it is actually, I think, um, slowed us down. And so as I looked at all this, and, and being an, a very big advocate, but also working in corporate America for many, many years, um, I just really wanted to write a book that showed explore, uh, employers that they could successfully do this. And by the way, you have already hired people with disabilities in your workforce. You've already successfully done it. Maybe they haven't self-identified. Maybe you don't realize you've already accommodated them. But just demystify some of it. And once again, look at this from a global perspective of what can we learn from other countries in the U.S. and, and, and each other. I mean, for example, um, in Egypt, I've done a lot of work in Egypt. And Egypt has done, they did this really amazing program where they um, trained um, 100 people, it was really 110 people that were blind to do different technology positions. And they didn't want to have employment outcomes because... 
you know, they were afraid maybe, you know, that would, um, it would be hard to achieve. Well, then they actually had a 70%, 70% employment rate for those people that were blind. And so that is something to talk about and to celebrate. In the U.S., we aren't often seeing a 70% success rate in employing people with disabilities. And so I think we really need to learn from each other and really look and see who's doing it right, who, oh, and, and once again, not who's doing it right because it, it's a really multidimensional situation, but what can we learn from each other and, um, and, and what programs are out there that it's like, wow, why did they have those successes in Egypt, for example? What can we learn from that? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's some interesting learning from, from that. In, in the UK and parts of Europe, uh, I think that we probably need to get the stick out in terms of accessibility at least. Uh, I think that's different from the quota systems because the quota systems, they've had the punitive approach. You talked about how it doesn't always work. Um, but equally, the, there are laws out there right now that are just not being enforced. So there, there, there needs to be that balance. I, I totally get what you're saying in, in the, the States about the, the punitive side of things going too far. But I think in, in the UK, we're we probably need a couple of test cases. And that's all I think it needs. It doesn't need everyone to sue everyone consistently, but you do need some, some, some kind of test cases to make the point, to show that the law has teeth. Because at the moment, I honestly feel that you're going to be gummed to, get, gummed to death by the law because it has no teeth. So, I agree. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's about finding that balance. Um, I know you said that you were approached by G3 ICT to to public uh, as the publisher, but but what made you say yes? Well, G3, th 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 thank you for asking that question. G3 ICT, I, I have been a longtime volunteer, um, and uh, I actually um, do consulting work with them as well. And I I really really like who G3 ICT is. Um, G3 ICT. G3ICT is a nonprofit that is a global um, nonprofit that focuses on helping countries and entities um, actually implement. At first, they implement the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. At first, they were just raising awareness and really trying to get um, countries to understand the importance of signing and ratifying it. Now we have 160 countries that have signed the convention, so there's some real success there. Um, now they're working to get, along with other groups, to help countries implement the convention. And it sort of goes back to what you were just saying, Neil. You've got laws all, all over the world on these issues, and most of them are just being ignored. And, and we see quota systems. Nah, people are just ignoring the quota system. The quota systems that we see any kind of movement on uh, usually have supports tied around them so that they actually can, you know, help employers understand the steps they need to take to meaningfully employ and retain people with disabilities. But if you just put a law out there and you do not in any way enforce it or give it any kind of teeth, we're seeing nothing being done. Um, so there's so much work. And, and, you know, whenever we see big lawsuits happening, um, well, when we're talking about them in the United States, because once again, everybody settles. Everybody settles. You do not want to be the brand that is not going to include people with disabilities. Really? Really? <laughs> so you don't, you don't want your brand to get into that particular uh, conversation in a negative way. But, you know, if we didn't have that, I don't think we would have had the successes uh, that we have had in the United States. I think one thing the United States can very proudly say is that we were very... Uh, we were one of the first starters in this conversation. And we did it by people with disabilities fighting for their rights and dragging themselves up at our court steps in Washington, D.C. And, you know, applause to all of those people that fought for their rights. And that's happening all over the world. But there's still so much work to do to meaningfully, really meaningfully include people with disabilities in the workforce. Okay. So, um, 
one of the topics that's also really close to my heart is around the whole design piece. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very hot on, on usability and user experience. And obviously, when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about the user experience for people with disabilities. So um, I, I know that that's another area that you've, you've covered in your book. So can you tell us a little bit about that too? Yes, and, and that's another thing that G3ICT focuses on is, you know, certainly the convention as a whole, but their, their focus is making sure that ICT, Internet Communications, that technology is accessible to all of us. And so that was very, that really appealed to me as a publisher. Um, the, Excel Leblois was, has been a CEO of many very, very, very large corporations all over the world, and one of his one of his former um, uh, CEO positions, he worked. He had a very large training organization, and they did thousands of books. So when he was saying, you know, we we'd really like to, you know, start getting involved again in publishing books that are very meaningful to people with disabilities. And so um, that was another reason why. But it, it, I think the accessibility part of it, it, it is just such an important part. And that's a field I've been in since, you know, early 2000. And, you know, helping, helping corporations, well, helping all organizations understand that when you make your website more accessible to people with disabilities, it improves the customer experience for all of your customers, your older customers, your customers that might, you know, have a different native language than the one that you uh, have your information in. So it, it makes it better for everybody. So accessibility is just such a really important part of it. And I, we, uh, all through the book, I weave accessibility and marketing into it, even though the book is on employment, it's on employability. I don't think you can have a conversation with employers about employing people with disabilities and retaining them without talking about accessibility and talking about, you know, marketing and how every aspect of the organization fits into this conversation. Yeah, I think that's fair. You've got, I mean, you've got employee brand. You know, disabled right. employees are part of your employee brand. Oh, Antonio, it's got a, uh, I know you've got a question. Uh, I do so. So, for what I was able to understand, uh, one of the purpose of your book is to inspire people, to inspire companies, to to create more confidence in the way how they hire people with disabilities. Yes, and um, I, you know, I think it's very important. I mean, we're going to start the book off in English, and then we're also going to translate it into all of the nine. Uh, you know, UN languages as we move forward um, and, you know, any other language that people will let us translate it in. But the, the um, and of course it would be great. We are also, we also want it to be an audio version so that everyone that ha needs access to it can have access to it. We want it to be a book that's very accessible um, to the readers. But, but it's, you know, I think it was so important as I was writing the book, once again, I wrote it many times, but I really, really like, you know, the, I'm, I'm really proud of what the book uh, became after many, um, many, you know, iterations of it and a lot of support from G3 ICT. But um, it's, sometimes when I read the book, I think, I know that people already know this information, but they, it seems like employers don't always know this information, you know, that you can't say, yes, we hire people with disabilities and then have an inaccessible career center. Oh, so wait a minute. So you hire people with disabilities. Does that include blind people? Well, I'm blind and I go to submit my resume, which is the only way that I can apply for a job with you. And it's not accessible. Well, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, are you including us or aren't you? So, And what about the person, the employee that already works for you that loses their sight? 80% of disabilities happen after we're born. Now, I mean, my, board, my daughter was born with Down syndrome, but most of us acquire a disability, you know, later, you know, as we live our life, as we follow the journey of our lives. So if things like that, that in some way, it feels common sense to me, but I, I think it's things that people haven't, employers haven't thought about. You know, how do you accommodate all of your employees? You know, 
if we go back to the to the to the history of uh, accessibility and at uh, the workplace, uh, you know, uh, what part of that is your book trying to, to cover? The importance of technology, or in the end, this is all mainly about people, and and sometimes technology is just there to help. We just need to to work uh, around the people and, and and around the knowledge in relation to accessibility. Well, and well said, Antonio, because employment is about people. But we need to make sure that we use all of the technological tools that we have at our disposal to make sure that all of your employees, you know, can... Um, participate in their very the very best way they can and that they can be productive and we want to the book really encourages employers to think outside the box themselves so you you know you want innovative creative employees well who better to have than somebody that thinks differently than another person you know some of their greatest minds are people with dyslexia and ADHD and you know the neurodiversity it, it, it's you know, it, it adds such value to the workforce and the productivity and the innovation. So I, I think it's got to be about people, but we've got to make sure that we're using all of the technology and all the tools that we have at our disposal so that we can all, you know, be successful. And with the always with the uh, bottom line goal of the corporation or the employer being successful. I remember one time I was interviewing, uh, a, I was training a group of people in Singapore and it, they were service providers. And I, I said to them, who is your customer? Is your customer the person with the disability that you're trying to get employed or is the employer your customer? And so several of them said, well, it's the person with a disability. And I said, well, that's really, no, it's got to be both. But, but you've got to want the employer to have a successful outcome because many times employers, especially when we're employing people with intellectual disabilities, they'll try hiring one person. You know, that's a lot of pressure on that one person. Hope they do a good job. Otherwise, that employer's not going to try again, right? And so just, you know, it, looking at it, you know, it like that to think about, you know, how do we use technology to accommodate all of our employees? Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, we want all of our employees to be productive. Neil, you've got a team of, what, 60 people working for you. No. You need all of your employees to be productive. Okay, so, it. yeah, it's <laughs> six, more like 16. But, um, but, no, but, but effectively, you know, everyone, you want to create the ecosystem within which people can, can thrive. And that requires organizational change, attitudinal change, uh, looking at processes, looking at systems. And and that can be big and scary. You know, when you when you when you say, Oh yeah, well it's not just about your website, have you thought about this, 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 this and you keep on listing and, and you can see either they they get the look of the rabbit in the headlights or, or you can see them glazing over and thinking, Yeah, they're too hard next. So right. so how do you strike that balance? Have you have you given people some advice in the book as to uh, how to address that in a way without actually scaring them so much that, that that they don't want to to take that step and start start employing people. Well, and, and you're right. It, it can be really scary, and you start naming off all the things they have to do, and it's like I'm just going to put the covers over my head because because now I'm just totally told I was scared before. Now I'm really scared. So I do offer in the book suggestions on, first of all, I assure them and I give them grounded examples. I think you should always give very grounded examples. And I give grounded examples of corporations that, employers that have actually been successful. But I talk about, you know, what they should do and, ha and assure them they have already done many of these things. Um, I, the, there's an example I use. I was interviewed uh, one time by um, a television reporter, and, and I knew what they were saying, but I was going to be a little cheeky. And they were saying, so, you know, tell us about it, um, accommodating employees. And I knew what they meant, but I said, well, I, as an employer, accommodate, um, I accommodated one of my employees whose wife was going to have their first baby. I know that when a baby comes into a household, it can be very disruptive, nobody's sleeping, and so I accommodated him with very flexible hours. I accommodated another employee that wanted to take Tuesdays at 2 o'clock off 
so he could coach his daughter's soccer. I also accommodate employees that need screen readers so they can be productive. Mm-hmm. And I accommodate employees. So you remind the employers, and I do this throughout the book, that we accommodate employees so that they're productive. And so I tell them what they need to do, and I give them examples, grounded examples, to help them understand they already know how to do some of this. And then I provide some um I do provide information, some of it I've gotten from the um, the Employer's Disability Forum that you're part of, Neil, with, under Susan Scott Parker. There's some wonderful resources out there about is, it, is technology, um, a cost of barrier, you know, is providing this technology a reason not to employ these people. And so I provide uh, information that's coming out of Australia and out of the UK and out of Ask Jan job accommodation networks in the United States about how we know that the cost of accommodation is not a barrier to employing people. And um, so I try to give them resources along the way, Neil, because some of it they can do themselves, but some of it, maybe you do need to go out and hire some um, accessibility consultants to give you a strat. First thing I would say is don't just go do an accessibility test. Put a strategy in place, and we talk about strategy and processes and how important that it is. Put, bring in an accessibility expert if you need to to create a, uh, you know, a roadmap and then decide where you have expertise and where you need to go out and get the expertise and then manage the roadmap. And so I, I, I try to roadmap all of the processes that need, they need to take and assure them that some of this you already know and you're already doing it. Some of them go out and get the experts, but don't do it until you have a plan or you might just be throwing money against the wall and letting it slide down the wall and you not then you're not successful. And I'll give you an example of that. There was a transportation um, company in one of the states in the United States, and they had um, a client complain because they, she said that the bus schedules were not accessible. So what they did was they went out and they took the bus schedules and they made them all braille. And it cost them about, they told me they spent $25,000. And I just shook my head and I said, so how did that work? And they said, well, you know, the problem with doing it that way is that we find that many of our our customers don't read Braille, even if they're blind. And our bus schedules sometimes change every 15 minutes. And I said, well, you know, you could have just gone out and made your website accessible. And the word document, they were using Word for the schedule. And then it's accessible to everybody. So they wasted, God bless them, that $25,000 trying to do the right thing, right? Yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot of money on, on embossed paper. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's immediately out of date. That's, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Good it example. was discouraged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's exciting. So, no, that's, that's great. So I'm looking forward to getting my signed copy. <laughs> well, since, since I quote you in the book, I will definitely do that, Neil. <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, super. So I think we're at the end of our half hour. Um, it's been nice to actually talk to you instead of talking to someone else for a change. So um, thank you very much, Deborah. Thank yes, you, Deborah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.